This episode contains spoilers from the entire Wheel of Time series. If you have not read the series, you are at risk of being spoiled. You have been warned. Thank you for tuning in to tonight's episode of the Black Tower Podcast, also known as your weekly dose of madness. Thank you for tuning in. Thank you for listening. You guys are awesome. This is the Black Tower Podcast. If you didn't already know, it is a Wheel of Time podcast where we discuss things in the Wheel of Time verse from the perspective of the people in the Black Tower. Not necessarily from the perspective, but you get the point. I am eating dinner. I am Daniel. And I am scrolling through memes on my phone. I mean, Andrew. <laughs> And uh, God, we'd at like... some point, none of us are actually going to introduce ourselves. It's just going to be weird <laughs> stuff. Oh, yeah. It's just going to be like the most randomest of things. Which... And I am currently churning butter. I'm churning <laughs> butter. Who wouldn't want to churn butter? Like, let's be honest uh, me. right now. Me. That's awful. <laughs> that sounds terrible. Fun Why fact. would you churn your own butter? Fun fact. Let's go, Ezekiel. This butter is not going to churn itself. <laughs> Idle hands all the devil's work. Fun fact. Um, you can actually put, uh, like cream, like whipping cream, heavy whipping cream. And, uh, say you wanted to put maybe like garlic or some sort of herbage, you know, put it into a jar and then just shake it. Just keep shaking it. Just shake the shit out of it. Shake it like it owes you money. And after a while, like a Polaroid pig, that's right. (laughs) You will have a nice chunk of herbal butter. Now you will have to pour out the, the separation, you know. Of course, but you will have a nice little chunk of herbal butter, and it's really delicious. All right, all right, all right, all right, all yeah. right, all right, all right, all right. And uh, for tonight's little soiree into Randland, into the land where men and women can channel the one power and affect the world around them using different weaves. We have a very special guest to introduce to us our spoiler warning. You may know them. Already played. What? Already played. Yeah, we're gonna, I'm just going to play it like as an intro. Well, that's not good. Now I sound Before like you're... an idiot. I, we can cut you it's... sounding like an idiot. No, you won't. Or I can leave it in and just clean I was about to say, I know you can. Will you? <laughs> Probably not. Yeah. Depends on what you want me to do. <laughs> <laughs> and how much I remember. <laughs> well, let me just put it to you this way. The spoiler warning, you probably already heard. Okay. Was Kate Redding and Michael Kramer? They're super awesome. They're awesome people. They are the the people who do the uh, the audio books, right? The the audio recordings. Correct. Correct. They are the voices of the audio books for the Wheel of Time series. And Michael Kramer was and even also the Mistborn series. Oh, I did not. They know do a that. ton of stuff. Yeah, we do. Um, yes, they do. Uh, they do a lot of stuff. But our yeah. listeners will probably know the Mistborn series as well. I don't know if they'll know the entire works that Kate Redding and Michael Kramer did. Yeah. You right. never know. You never know. I'm trying to look up what episode because the spoiler warning is actually from an episode we did with Kate with them and Michael. And mm-hmm. it was episode 17, uh, The Voices of the Wheel of Time. Correct. So, Which is, I mean, that's that's pretty cool, honestly. February that... 4th of 2019. Uh, well, no, February right. 15th was whenever it should have posted. For anybody that wants to go back and they're looking at dates and stuff to try to listen to that one. I think it's one of our top downloaded episodes, maybe? Well, Correct. it's because Mr. Kramer and, and Mrs. Redding were on there. It's great. Yep. Yeah fantastic guests to have and they're just absolutely wonderful people for anyone that hasn't had the absolute pleasure of being able to talk to them or speak with them yet i also love the fact that you know again podcast perfect place for them to be on oh it's yeah. true i think, well, well, I think when we talked to them they said they, they had majestic actually, voices yeah i think when we talked to them they said they had actually never that they could remember at least at the time being guest on a podcast so i think oh, well, wow. i believe we were the first at least at least that they could remember at the time and put it that way. Hell yeah. There's a chance that there hey. have been on others, but and after I'm that the they boss. got a taste for it and they were like, Oh, we like this. Mm-hmm. And then they started their own. No, I <laughs> they didn't. 
<laughs> no, but uh, tonight's episode, we're going to start a, a series that we think will be really fun. We're going to take a deep dive into some different cultures from the wheel, the wheel of time. Um, because there's Indeed. Robert Jordan did such a great job with creating such a diverse uh, realm in which different cultures, different peoples, different nations, and different ideals exist. Um, and they always capitalize this in every single book when he says something along, you know, my favorite is when they start talking about, um, you know, the Sanchin invasion and there's things along the lines of, uh, the story gets twisted every so often. And, uh, you know, it's like the Sachin arm, the Sachin army is, is making land, you know, and I love how, how he creates a world in which rumor spreads like waves of an ocean into the land. And it changes a little bit, a little bit, a little bit until it gets to the point where it's like, what are you even talking about? And where, you know, to the point where you get people in the South along the coast who think that shadow spawn is a legend it's it's a scary ghost story to tell little kids before they go to bed yeah i can't remember if this was a discussion that uh, i saw on twitter or if it was one in the discord i think it was twitter i can't remember exactly but it was talking about the realistic portrayal of the trollic wars and how they would have it was an absolutely massive terrible thing but it's the scope of it is kind of lost on the current age in the book series it's still reference. Right. It's, oh, it's, it's fresh enough to still be used as a reference for an absolutely mm-hmm. horrible, horrific time, but it still has lost a lot of its impact on exactly what the Trolloc Wars were and the amount of carnage that was involved. And I think one of the comments I saw that I liked the most said, you know, it's, it's realistic. You know, nowadays we have history books and everything, but if you have an era where you don't have the mass media type things that we have now, it's very easy to forget wars that were three, four, five hundred 500 years ago, much less, you know, a thousand years ago. Well, okay. Well, yeah, instance, I mean, like we still have people, I, I, we don't have people alive that, that, you know, remember a time where you had no idea what was going on, you know, three countries over. Yep. Uh, but at the same time, I mean, that is definitely a part of human history that, there were entire wars that were waged in countries yep. that were completely and utterly unknown. Oh yeah. To other countries a hundred miles away. And so the fact that, that again, with time and distance, it really is completely and utterly believable that these people who do not have, you know, the, the weekly wheel news and, <laughs> and whatnot, uh, are totally not even that, that a lot of people in the wetlands in the Southlands don't even know that shadow spawn is real. They think they're just ghost stories, let alone understand that there were Trollocs down in their midst a thousand years ago, killing their brethren. Well, if you want, if you want some perspective on this, There are people alive today. Now, granted, not many of them, but there are people alive today who lived, experienced, and fought in World War II, okay? And Mm -hmm. all the atrocities that happened in World War II. And then there are people alive today who think that that was all a hoax, that that was made up, that that didn't actually happen. And I'm just... That was what 80 years ago i mean that that was 80 years ago if you want to know how short the memory span of humanity is simply look at our own history now where you've got borderlands that have been defending the realm from shadow spawn for 3000 years and the blight has been silent relatively speaking for 3000 years you know i mean I don't think it's entirely unfair for people down in Andor to be like, those are nightmares. Those are kid stories. That's, that's what you tell kids when you want to scare them. I mean, Trollocs don't actually exist. We haven't seen a Trolloc in a thousand years. It it still blows my mind to a degree that you have an entire 
uh, society essentially, the borderlanders, that they've known their entire life. Not uh, not only that Trollocs are real, but they've seen them, they've fought them, and they continuously fight the forces of the shadow. And to tell them, you know, to, to ask them about the Drakkar, the Trollocs, or anything like that, they're like, yeah, it's fucking real. You don't fuck around with the shit. That's what we're here for, and that, and we're the ones that fight them. And then you have people that are just like, oh, that's just an old wives tale. Those those people don't really exist. Those things aren't real. Uh, it's just something. You know, there's people that, that, that even say the Forsaken aren't real. That they never were real. That it's just a story to scare children into behaving. Exactly. Like the Boogeyman. But I'm here to tell you, the Boogeyman was real. Just like Santa Claus. <laughs> real. Or was. It's real. true. But it, it's just kind of crazy. That, like You can have an entire group of people. A massive collection of nations that deal with this on a day-to-day basis. And then, yeah, it's several leaks to the South far, far away, but you have an entire group of people that think it's just fake. And I mean, it, it, I think it also goes to show that kind of hallmark of the, the perception of war based on distance. When war is far away, it doesn't seem that bad, but whenever you're living it and you're close to it now, it's horrible. You know, that's part of what made Vietnam so bad for the American public was they had never really seen war until pretty much after it was done when the pictures came out versus Vietnam, the war was being live broadcast on TV and everybody was horrified. It's like, actually, yep. this has been going on for years and years and years. This is what you have been <laughs> this, sending me. This is how this works. For. Like, remember when everybody got pissed and we got into World War One and then World War Two? This is the shit that was happening. It's just now you actually have to see it. You can't just pretend it's, it doesn't exist. Well, and that is really, you know, so much the difference between propaganda and, as you said, like live reporting is when you get the raw footage of what war looks like, it is horrifying when you get the, oh, well, we have, you know, people going ahead and taking pictures and, you know, doing filmed things of of World War Two. But then by the time that it gets back to the States, it's all been not necessarily so doctored. I mean, like that's not really a fair word, but it's been put through a filter of, we actually want to make this look like a righteous war. We w- which again, in that case, I, I think that you can make a very strong argument for it. I'm not saying it wasn't a righteous war, but like, you know, when you get the chance to take all of those pictures and, and those, you know, film and, and put it through that filter before people get to see it, it's a very, very different looking experience right. than, oh no, we're sending you the raw footage of what these people are going through and how absolutely ridiculous this is. And I'm not sure about you guys, but I don't remember seeing many passages in the Wheel of Time about cameras. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't... I mean, There were a couple. There were a few, actually, I think. Um I think there were. I think there was a photographer with Val and Lucas Circus. Am I making that up? I'm probably making that up. You're making that up. Uh, probably it happens. I do that frequently. But I'm just saying. My main point. My overall ever point loyal is that listeners, there are not a lot. Let us know if uh, if Josh was making that up or not. Because <laughs> in, in case we're wrong, because then we'll know if you're really listening. Yeah, I don't. I don't think it, that's true. I don't think. I don't remember hearing anything about it. Actually, while well, y'all are. Still, while you're making your point, Josh, I'm going I'm to try to do some looking up real quick. Anyway, my point is, is that you've got uh, thousands of years since the Trollic Wars. You've got thousands of years since the breaking of the world. You've got borderlanders who they don't ever really define how often they have skirmishes with shadow spawn. They definitely talk about it. They definitely say, Oh yeah, we, we, we talked shadow spawn. And then in the books, they talk about how the blight is advancing and they're going, okay, something's not right. This is not cool. You know, some shit's going down and we don't know what to do about it. Like, so that those kinds of things happen, but they don't have a lot of, person-to-person interaction or even historical data like hard historical data to tell people that this is a very real threat a lot of people aren't even sure they believe in the the story of the dragon reborn they're just like oh yeah okay whatever we we you know we know that's a story but 
you know, who knows how accurate that is. And so for people to not believe in shadow spawn is totally believable in, in my opinion, I, I believe this totally a believable aspect of the story. But what amazes me is how well prepared the shadow spawn are because there is a vast array of shadow spawn ready to invade the southern lands. Well, I mean, let's let's look at who ultimately commands the shadow spawn. The dark one's been around age after age after age after age. I mean, if if you look at the way time yes. works, and it, I mean, it is confirmed. Time is circular, circular, circular. Whatever you want. To, yeah, circular. Cyclic. Cyclical. Cyclical. Yeah. Time Cyclical. goes around without end. <laughs> and the, it's a great big yeah. wheel. You get you it. You get it. The wheel of time goes around a and around. A wheel of yeah. time. But someone's mind was just yeah. blown. <laughs> oh, God. I finally, I finally get it. Welcome to the family, friend. <laughs> These There's are the some moments. sweet tan biscuits off the to the side. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> but Mother's milk in a oh, cup. Whoa, whoa, whoa language. <laughs> Freaking light skirt. But uh <laughs> Jesus call it Brigida. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's how you know the shit's going down. We found down. sound effect buttons. I'm not exactly sure what track if any they're recording on. What if I like listen back to this and they're not even in there? They're that would be hilarious. Like, oh, you know you what? Know, see yeah. it being on yours whenever you play it you'll see like the, the sound effect oh, waves. Yeah. So but it's if, definitely on yours. If they weren't there, we could act like they were, but it would be the madness. So instead of lose Theron's voice, we hear random sound effects. I hear Hashtag madness. I'm, I'm there. I'm right here. Day I don't know. Yeah, where. exactly. But exactly. That that was a perfect sound. You just played Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. It yeah, accentuated no. my point. It perfectly. Yeah, no, the soundtrack for Demise Wells is just Deiru Sandstorm. Oh God! But um, too soon. Is it too soon or is it too early? Hey, oh! I mean, I guess it's not really like contradictory like statement. I like how that is the exact same statement, and yet those actually yeah. mean different things. Yeah, because the soon has the connotation that it's like after the fact, but early means before the fact. My head hurts. I mean, anyway, anyway, but anyway yeah. so the Dark One has been around age after age after age after age, and has fought war after war after war, and as of this point, however many ages have passed in the entire history of, of the Wheel of time averse has not had a complete victory, I'm going to say. Though he True. has also not really had a oh, complete yeah. victory. I mean, the thing I, is, is... I like that. I like how a, that's worded. a moment, we've already done the spoiler warning, at the end of the series, where Rand is like, there was a moment where I believe I could have destroyed the Dark One, but it would have destroyed everything. Because you, yeah. can't, you can't have Which an ultimate is... good without an ultimate evil. You have to have a counterbalance, and that's that's what the ultimate. Uh, that's kind of one of the things that, especially Moraine, tries to convey heavily about the wheel is that the pattern strives for balance. One way or another, things balance out, and, and that's what makes the yep. so special is because they seem to be able to bend those rules of balance. Which is one of my favorite sort of fan theories. Now, this has not been confirmed with anyone. This is simply a fan theory that I have and I love it. But when you talk about the dragon reborn leading up to Shia Ghoul and facing off against the dark one, learning how this works, learning what's happening. There is a moment in which the dark one tells Rand, you know, basically that, you know, what he represents or what the dark one represents versus what Rand represents. And there's, there's, there's wiggle room in the story for Rand taking out the dark one, killing the dark one and saying, yep. Okay. We're done. 
we've got this. It's all, it's all out. And, uh, and then leaving nothing to counteract the dark one's touch. So then the wheel has to generate another dragon to counteract the dark one. And the, the reason I think about this is because I feel like, you know, when they talk about the great heroes of the horn, they don't talk about the, uh, the dragon being summoned when the horn is sounded. So the dragon is a figure is something that is constantly being re-added to the pattern. I guess you could say, did any of that make sense or am I just that taken with I the mean, madness? Um, I am going to throw out there that you're taken with the madness because you said that there's a moment where Rand can kill the dark one and take him out. And then the wheel would put out another dragon to counteract the dark one. But if the dark one's gone, then the dragon can't. Well, but Rand would then become the dr- the dark one because he would become the destroyer rather than the creator representative. Ah, I see now what you're saying. Yeah. So does that, I mean, now granted, that's a bit of a headcanon and it's a bit weird. It's a bit out there. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, I'm with you, and it is definitely an interesting theory. And, and of course, we do have a little bit of a And it's problem. just for fun. And it's I put those fun. in quotes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, again, since we only ever see it from, you know, Rand and his allies in this one particular age's perspective, uh, and we don't have, you know, the even the the moment necessarily where Neo is in the room with the architect and seeing his face on all of the TV screens. Like, right, we exactly. don't actually really know what has happened in the past or what will happen in the future. We have a good idea because, right. again, time is cyclical, but it is a little bit, you know, OK, but we don't really know. And so it really is a, a situation where the the question then becomes about free will. Because does Rand actually have the ability to eviscer or to to eliminate the Dark One? Or is he always destined to not to? I mean we well, exactly. there's yeah. not actually a decision. We do get a there. fair glimpse into the future um a, well a future that did not include the dragon's piece, albeit. Um, yes. through Avienda. So as far as after the dragon's piece was signed, um, there's no telling how accurate or different it was. I mean, there's still the viewing from men that talks about Avienda's children and that she'll have four, but they'll be there's something off, but they'll be healthy, but there's something off. Um, so there, there's still that kind of weirdness there. But I kind of have always viewed the soul of the dragon uh, in its entirety, as far as the full like Dragon Reborn being a thing that is almost the the full soul doesn't get reincarnated uh, or born again until there's a need. Because the way I look at it, if, if the right. if the entire purpose of the pattern of the of the uh, the wheel is to is to maintain and try to restore balance, then there's no need to spin out the dragon until the shadow is too strong and about to break free. Cause he, cause he right, kind of serves as that kind of pseudo Messiah figure. Um, mm-hmm. And he, even at the end of, uh, at a memory of light, it's almost like there tries to be this illusion to, well, all the previous dragons have resealed the boar incorrectly. I've done it right. Which is, I'm sure what every single dragon has ever said. And done. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> Though it, it would be interesting if we could somehow get insight onto previous iterations of the dragon, you know, were they able to do what Rand was able to do? Were they able to, you know, pull a Captain Ginyu and change bodies with Moradin <laughs> or, 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 or Forsaken or change bodies and survive? Or, you know, did they die? Did I mean, we know for a fact that Luz there and uh, Telamon survived his battle with the dark one only to be for him and the hundred companions to be driven insane immediately and thus begin the breaking of the world. 
Well, and that actually also brings up another question is what exactly did Luz Theron try yeah. to do? Because they, they do leave it kind of vague in the story as far as, you know, they know that he was sort of fighting the Dark One in some right. ways and trying to do something that was very arrogant mm -hmm. as right. far exactly. as, as what the Dark One was. So does that mean that the Dark One is actually unkillable? And so when Rand looks at it and says, I could take you out, is he just wrong? And that that's exactly the same thoughts as Luz Theron had, and then trying to kill the Dark One actually caused the backlash. I don't think. Or is it a situation where Luz Theron was trying to do something else and... You know, it was a different age and a different time, and the Dark One was different, and the Dragon was different, and blah, blah, blah. And so we are actually seeing an age where everything's different. Yeah. And that Rand can actually see new things. I personally, I don't think that the Dark One is unkillable as himself, as the Dark One is. What The essence of the yeah, Dark what, One. What I'm thinking, if I what I think happened is that when it was Luz there and Telamon, in his arrogance, he decided with the hundred companions they were going to destroy the Dark One. And I, I would, I would think that realizing that this would destroy the fabric of time and destroy the wheel itself, which is ultimately what the Dark One wants anyway, that perhaps the Creator stepped in and and Ooh, dampened maybe. down what he tried to do. You know, a kind of like, yeah, I know I just sided against the people that are fighting my enemy, but it's for the greater good of the continuation of of life. And whenever Rand sees it, Rand has that, because of course the Rand that we see at this point is that Zen Rand, the I'm going to burn myself out. Correct. I'm going to create a second Dick mountain as the white tower likes to say, um, <laughs> but it has the absolutely fortunate benefit, the one in a million chance of somewhat, at least for the most part, healing his own madness. Um, once again, yeah, Ran doing something that he has no idea how to do that Ishmael knew how to do, at least to some extent. Um, but Ran, of course, never did. But so Ran, well, and Ran and has during, a, uh, go ahead. I was just going to say, Rand even says when he has this revelation that this time will be different because this time I was raised mm. better. So, you know, there is a very, there's a whole lot of story that that we just don't get about Luz Theron. And I, I feel like we're getting what we're seeing. I mean, you know, and granted this is kind of, you know, uh, a roundabout way of, of getting into tonight's subject, but I feel like what we're seeing is the results of the previous time that the creator and the dark one went head to head and the creator chose Luz Theron as his champion or as its champion, whatever. And Luz Theron kind of went, I got this bitch. Yeah. I can do this shit. And he got arrogant. He got cocky and it didn't work out so well for him. And as a matter of fact, people yeah. suffered for the next 3000 years. I mean, a memory of, of like kind of sells Zen Rand as a difference as a different to every other dragon that has ever existed, the way it kind of seems to be portrayed is that this, this iteration, this event that we see with Rand as the dragon reborn with his revelation that, you know, good cannot exist without evil. There are two sides of the coin. Cause he gets a lot of inspiration from the symbol of the Aes Sedai, right. you know, which really hallmarks back to, to um, Hindu style culture with the yin and yang and, uh, or isn't, that's not Hinduism, is it? It's not, no, it's not, what is it? Um, I'm just gonna, and for the sake of not being wrong, I'm just say Asian culture. Because um, <laughs> as soon as I said it, I was like, "That's that's not Hinduism." I'm like, eh, brain fart. Um, my no, no. my college class of world religions is failing me right now. I, well, my memory is. <laughs> to put it that way, it is in Chinese philosophy. It is a concept of dualism in ancient Chinese there philosophy. You Thank you, Daniel. So that. So it's it's much like that where it's you know you have you can't have one without the other and that's why they have you know when you see the traditional yin yang symbol there's a dot of white in the black and a dot of black in the white um, 
to show that you know you can't have one without the other they're two sides of the same coin and it's the Zenran that sees this and i kind of get the impression that from the way things are written that for the entirety of of human history in the wheel of time uh universe that the the focus has been on destroying the shadow destroying the dark one and it ultimately never works because it would destroy the fabric of time and if if you take that with the pattern uh, insistence on finding and restoring and maintaining balance uh, on the large scale, then it wouldn't make sense that any mm-hmm. of any effort by anybody like Luz there and Telemon to destroy the Dark One completely would have dire consequences to rebound as far as balance and keep that from happening uh, as a kind of self preservation of the pattern, which by extension means that the pattern is somehow sentient and. Uh, May, then you have the argument that the creator and the dark one together make or, the collective conscience of the pattern. Or it's the creator who is at the wheel spinning the pattern itself. I mean, it could be. And as we see in Wanted, the pattern <laughs> kind of spins itself and the creator is the one who's just providing. That, that doesn't the work because Morgan, Morgan Freeman's character just like bastardized the entire <laughs> thing. You don't think Morgan Freeman could I mean, be the creator? I mean, I've seen Bruce huh? Almighty. He no. Could be. <laughs> so the creator uses the dragon in his effort to balance and or combat the dark. The dark one has his own little army. Which so is interesting headcanon before we get quite into this. Oh, Why are you putting a cannon it. against your head? I know. Because I want to go out in a blaze of glory and shotgun isn't big Do you enough. need to talk somebody? <laughs> go big or go home, I mean, goddamn! I know your older brother like got the fancy title and the crown of swords and everything, but just no reason to headcanon yourself. <laughs> Maybe he's got other things going on. Why I'm not judging. judging. I'm just saying we're here yeah. if you need to talk. We're all We're all mad here. In the words of the rabbit from Alice. Understood. We are all mad here. It is true. Embrace the taint. (laughs) So interesting. As we were just talking about this, I'm now thinking, what if what we know is the Dark One hasn't actually been around for ages and ages and ages and ages and ages and ages? What if basically like two times ago, effectively... There was a dragon who killed the Dark One and then became the Dark One. Well, that's what I was saying earlier. What if Luz Theron is actually the first dragon who didn't kill the Dark One? And so this Ooh. talk about like the dra- the you know Dark One has been around for ages and ages and ages is actually incorrect. That the Dark One's essence and, and the fact that there sort of has always been a Dark One has always been true. But that this particular Dark One is actually not the original. What if this is a Dread Pirate Roberts situation? Because <laughs> I love that idea. Is Good that night, Rand farewell. is actually just Most fighting likely kill you the, in the, morning. the dragon of two ages past effectively. The one just before Luz Theron. And that that is one of the reasons that the Dark One is actually incapable of winning so hard. Because, of course, I mean, like, obviously this is a story of good and evil and good always triumphs. Or pretty much always. But... Ish. Like, at the same time, what if one of the ways that that becomes more believable is that the Dark One isn't actually this, you know completely undying entity that has been around for millennia, but it's actually just the previous dragon. Holy shit. That's great. I love that idea. <laughs> nice. That literally Luz Theron is spun out to fight the dragon that came before him, and then Rand is spun out when Luz Theron fails. Well, that would make sense because... The Dark One and the Creator are not physical entities. They are, correct. you know, d- creation and destruction spinning around and around and around in the great wheel of time, in the great wheel of time. And then 
they would spin out a counterbalance and or counterweight to balance the wheel. I yep. mean, that's just how it is. And then the, the heroes so of the horn destroy one of those counters. Then it just exactly. spins out a new one to balance that. Exactly. And then, and then you've got the, the heroes of the horn who are, Oh shit's really fucked up. Okay. We need a whole <laughs> bunch of weights on this side. Mm hmm. Anyway, speaking of the dark one, uh, <laughs> he's got some interesting entities on his side balancing out his uh, his side of the wheel here. His militaristic oh, might. So the shadow spawn is the tool of the dark one. You may have heard of them. I mean, the, the, the most common shadow spawn in the book is Trollocs everybody knows a Trollocs. And anytime you read a book, all the major books have a sort of animalistic, brutal, uh, evil military, uh, unhuman, inhuman military. Lord of the Rings had orcs and trolls. And then eventually they had the Urukai. Um, Game of Thrones had the whites, uh, you know, a lot of the fantasy epics, they have their own versions of the inhuman, brutal, completely no question about it, evil side foot soldiers. And when we start out with that, we start out talking about Shadow Spawn. We start yeah, talking about let's Trollocs. talk about the Shadow Spawn Trollocs in general. Are... First. There, there's some yeah, okay. Talk about the Shadow Spawn in general. Um, so the IL, I, I love the term the IL use instead. They call them the Shadow Rot. Like, mm -hmm. you know, you rot yes. as in, you know, forged from the shadow. Um, there's different varieties. We're going to, we've got about 10 name varieties that we're going to go through uh, over the remainder of this podcast, or at least try to. Yeah, I'll bet you didn't know there was that much shadow. <laughs> um, that's just the you. 10 named ones that we see in the series. There's always illusions to there being more and everything, but. Um, well, they even talk about how the world is so right. much bigger. And when you even talk about like, at the last battle, Demandrid comes in with a whole nation that hasn't even been mentioned yeah. <laughs> throughout the entire... You're like, who the fuck are these so I know guys? For a long time, reading through the series, I was, I was like, why doesn't one of the Forsaken open a massive gateway and just drop a bunch of Shadow Spawn through? Well, that's because nearly all of them will instantly die if they attempt to pass through a gateway. That's true. Now, do they ever discuss why Shadow Spawn can't transport uh, through the gateway? No. Or is it I just think it's a, a thing? way with they never yeah. get into the specifics of it. But if I had to guess, it yeah. has something to do with how they were how they were created by Agonor. Because most of them are artificially created life, uh, attributed to uh, created in the Age of Legends, and it's uh, virtually right. all of them were created by the Forsaken Agonor. Um, which leads an incredible credence to when we see him the first time in Eye of the World. Um, he was formerly known as Ishar yeah. Morad Chuain, and he was one of the 13 Forsaken trapped at Shao Ghul due to the, the dragon ceiling being a uh, Kinslayer. And that's, that's his achievement. His, his biggest achievement was the creation of the Shadow Spawn. Um, and it almost seems like it was. We know that the Forsaken were incredibly wary of their construct of their constructs, uh, incredibly fearful of anything that could potentially ever pose a threat. So perhaps it was one of those. Let's give them a weakness to a gateway. If they try to go through, they're going to die. So that if we need to get away from them, if they turn on us, we can just gateway away, and then anyone that try to follow us just fucking die. Um, It'd be as simple as that. I I, th I think that's a good point. They definitely seem to build a lot of sabotages mm -hmm. into their own, uh, I guess, forces because they do fear. Like, w I mean, the Forsaken fear more than anything. They fear betrayal or, mm -hmm. you know, the Dark One turning on them and saying, oh, no. Because, I mean, Asmodean was like shitting himself when he lost his connection yeah. to the Dark One. So it was during the War yep. of Power that Agonor created the, the all the Shadow Spawn that we know of. Or at least most of them, um, and some, uh, notably the Trollocs, were used creating human and animal stock, uh, and the byproducts of that often became other shadow spawn as well. Uh, the genetic, the genetic engineering yep. is carrying out with the one power, 
and gave many of the shadow spawn special attributes uh, and to infuse them with the uh, with shadow taint so they were inherently evil so they were manufactured with the taint already in them so they would be inherently evil uh, one of the startling right. statistics I find is it's estimated that there were 50 million people that died in order to fuel the exp- just the experiments that Aganor undertook to create the Trollocs alone. So we have right. no idea how many more died to create the more powerful Shadow Spawns, such as Murdral and the the, uh, the Drakkar and the others that we'll go through. Right. And they actually discuss briefly Aganor's failed experiments, how he had numerous other experiments where he tried to create other types of shadow spawn that Mm -hmm. failed and they did it Mm -hmm. basically with captured humans they would capture people probably most likely more after the ways were closed probably most of the borderlanders um that were captured and taken but um so yeah, so whenever you look at the structure of strength as far as, well, not I don't want to say strength, but um, your typical, if you wanted to look at it, just your, your foot soldier, your throw into the meat grinder because we're the shadow and we don't care about uh, our people, which we really can't call them people. I mean, these are literally creatures created for war and inherently evil. Um, right. Trollocs are make up... Uh, a fair bulk of the battle power and battle force of the shadows armies. Right. Correct. That's, that's yeah. their infantry. Yeah, they're, the, they're the most, abundant. I mean, th- those are, those are the grunts. I mean, if, if you want to start, if you want to use modern day terms, that's your heavy infantry. That's your, that's your Marines. If you will, those are the guys, those are, those are the ones that are going to be storming yeah. the beaches. Um, mm-hmm. So Trollocs are characterized by their, their humanoid generally in shape with attributes of animals. Uh, most notably it's, you see ones that have uh, like wolf's fur or bear's fur, or they have like an Eagle's beak or a bird's beak or uh, goat's horns, some attributes of, of different animals. Um, though the wiki says the body of a man and the head and feet of animals, uh, there's more than that. Uh, it's not just the head and feet that can be of animals. I mean, head and feet happens. There's also hands that are more claws. There's entire bodies that are more animal than man. Um, they're generally quite large around eight feet tall, uh, unable to swim and will not even wade through waist deep water unless pushed by a merge roll. They will, they merge all can we, force them to try to right. uh, crawl some water. Um, Especially those they yeah. are connected with, because that is a an interesting thing with the Trollocs is that uh, it doesn't really seem like there are hardly any other shadow spawn that sort of connect with mm-hmm. something. Uh, but the Trollocs are basically like a merge all can come along and be connected with a group of of Trollocs and it can order them better and do a a number of different things better to make those Trollocs and to force those Trollocs into situations that they would not necessarily get into themselves. However, that does have a drawback that you don't necessarily need to kill an entire band of Trollocs. You just need to kill the Merdral they are connected to and then they all yeah. die. But uh, we'll get into that more. But if you've listened to the previous episode we did Indeed. exclusively on Merge All, you know that's not as e- that's far easier said than done. But <laughs> but oh, that well, their course. unruly nature, it might actually be easier in some cases to just kill the oh, entire yeah. band. Well, of I mean, trollics. if you've got an Illuminator <laughs> on your side that's found her Bell Founder and made cannons, and fuck yeah, blow up all the Trollocs. But. Hell yeah, anyway, yeah. so the Trollocs were, because of their bloodlust, that's an allusion to you, Aludra. <laughs> you I go, see, girl. Right. Hashtag Team Aludra. Yeah. hey Not bad. <laughs> we got the but, sound. Um, so the, their, uh, their bloodlust so and their, their inability to be used as, uh, alone at least, as a formable kind of uh, disciplined military they were originally labeled as a failed experiment um, because the Trollocs themselves are incredibly strong. They're very large. They make them powerful troops. However, they just follow bloodlust and they can't follow orders on their own. Uh, and that's where you get the, the linking with right. the Merdral that is able to 
essentially scare them into following orders and doing what the merge all says it's you know the merge all comes in as such itself it's alpha pack leader and they're all like okay yeah whatever you say um but it's only the male trollocs that right. fight while the female do little else but serve as breeding machines um so that does confirm there are female trollocs but they don't they don't fight right. generally they're they're just there to have ki- uh, to produce more and more trollocs which yes, which is another like actually quite a terrifying mm-hmm. thing about Trollocs is yes, even though the first ones were the Frankenstein patchwork quilt from the imagination of Agenor, Agenor actually had the foresight to say, "Tell you what, let's make these things breedable. Let's make these things so that they can breed themselves, so that long after I'm gone, the Trollocs can continue on making more." Trollocs. I don't know why Agenor has that accent. Why don't you just try to make Agenor sound like Trump? That's that's all that just happened. I didn't try. Well, I wasn't going for Trump. But if we're going to talk about making Trollocs, I mean. But, I mean, it's essentially essentially a super soldier program. Let's take these amazing attributes from all these very strong animals, these wolves, these birds, these bears, uh, goats, uh, apparently. And let's insert, let's try to splice this DNA with humans. I mean, this is right now, this is what we see currently with biochemistry, but this is done with magic and a forsaken who's just like, what happens if I stick bird shit in this dude's body and see what happens? Right. I mean, it's, it's very rudimentary kind of bio, uh, biochemistry and genetic engineering. But they do, the Trollocs are divided into bands, like uh, like you said earlier. Uh, each one has their own uh, sigil. And the nomenclature is used for some of these tends to express uh, mythological or fantasy creatures. Uh, and the wiki lists, what, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 12 different uh, bands. You have the Efrit that are symbolized by our warwind, the ghouls, the banshees, the devils. They're represented by horn skulls, the demons that are represented by iron fists, the jinn, the gargoyles, the goblins that are represented by a goat skull, the golem, the gremlin, uh, the kobold or cobalt, uh, represented by a blood red trident, and the gnomes. Uh, right, and it's it's important to note that they never really get too deep in the series about the different bands and their different like I guess their capabilities, Mm -hmm. but I would imagine that, you know, where you've got these different bands based on different physical attributes, they would have to have different specialties. Um, And I would imagine if Mr. Jordan were alive today, he would, he'd be able to say, Oh yeah. You know, the, the Banshee were more speedy infantry. Whereas the, the, the Cobals were more, I I, I don't know, but I, I would like to think that, you know, when Agenor was using the genetic material of the different animals and fusing them into the different beings that he was trying to, you know, figure this stuff out, that that would retain some of their capabilities and that these different bands would have not only their own sigil, but their own capabilities and their own specialties yeah. as well. This drink moment brought to you by madness it's great <laughs> madness now in can form sold at your local 7-eleven <laughs> pour up a nice cool cold glass of madness that should be a dope drink. really is there a better metaphor for the taint than like whiskey mm. like it's so sickly vile but you just love it you yeah, know what i'm saying yeah, it could be it's right there that that's it i wonder if that's what robert jordan was talking about when he was like oh i'm gonna come up with something for the madness for the taint oh, yeah. mm. he probably had like a really good scotch and he was like oh oh i want more hey that's <laughs> it right there that's i'm gonna go with that i'm gonna say that that's works for me with it now back to our regularly scheduled program when last <laughs> we left off we were talking about the different bands of trollocs <laughs> But I mean, <laughs> there's there's really not that much to say about Trollocs. I mean, they're they're known for they will decimate an entire village and 
kidnap all the people in it just to eat. They they do consume uh, human flesh. Uh, in dire situations, they'll consume other trollics. Um, generally speaking, they're they're very lazy. They won't try to. They don't really hunt after hard prey unless they're pushed by Murdral. Uh, they try to take the easy prey um, and kill whatever they whatever they can, uh, and just throw them in a cook pot. And, you know, it's it winds up being a, a common saying throughout the book series of you know you don't want to wind up in a Trolloc's cook pot um, because it's considered vile. You know, it's a boiling right. stew of human flesh. You know, think like. Goblet of Fire, Voldemort dumped in the cauldron, kind of thing. Which, just... yeah, no, it's 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 definitely it's vile. Like the Trollocs are, whew, they're definitely like the gritty, vile, dark, nasty piece yeah. of this. I mean, universe. They're, they're just that's primal, I'm sure. So they have, yeah, they yeah. primal. That's, that's an that's excellent. All they are. Word. They're, they're primal battle machines that can only be controlled by an entity whose main one of their main attributes is instilling fear just by its mere presence in anything it's around that's it like the only uh, that, and i firmly believe that the only reason trollocs listen to merge all is because merge all terrify trollocs that much well and and you know that's that's the interesting thing about Merge Rawl, and I think this is a nice segue into Merge Rawl, is that their main ability, I mean, they're very fast. They have that eyeless gaze. You know, everything, like, they're terrifying creatures. But their main ability is to instill fear into whomever they are focused on at the moment. And you see that, I mean, in book one, I have the world when Rand first meets, you know, he's, he's walking along the road and there's a, a, a black cloak that doesn't move with the wind. And he looks in the face and he sees no eyes. And it's just, it's just the most terrifying feeling he's ever had in his life. And then it just goes whoop, vanishes. And he's like, geez, I, I must've imagined that it's such a terrifying experience that they can't even you know, wrap their heads around what just happened. And and that's their main ability uh, other than of course, you know, like lightning quick reflexes, uh, yeah. strength, uh, you know, stuff Daniel, like that. You want to, you want to take us but to again, murder? Cause I think, I think we're pretty much done with Trollocs unless y- y'all can think of anything else we haven't mentioned yet. No, that's the beautiful thing about Trollocs is that, you know, they are just downright, Bare the bones, beautiful thing about Trollocs is blood true. Trollocs are and grit. Things. What about <laughs> primal? Okay, thank Their you, Doctor Aganor. Their bottoms are made out of people. Who gave Aganor <laughs> the microphone? They're bouncy, trouncy, trouncy, <laughs> bouncy, fun, 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 fun. But the most wonderful thing about Trollocs is there's a hundred and million the of them. I made all the ones. Easy <laughs> there. Okay, Daniel, I'm gonna need you to get. Aganor and put him back in the boar and seal him back up. Sorry, I just do, did. You guys say something? Because I <laughs> lost myself for a moment. He's Wait a minute. He's Who are you? Sauce. <laughs> Sorry, it was the madness for a moment. <laughs> but yeah, I'd love to go ahead and go through my yeah, Go for it, man. I believe in you. Or in the words of Emperor Palpatine, do it. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> He's actually not Emperor yet at that point. <laughs> I love democracy. <laughs> <laughs> so this is how democracy dies. Thunderous applause. Anyway, so Murdral. <laughs> Murdral! Uh, so occasionally when Aganor was uh, working with the experiments that would become the Trollocs uh, or even continuing now that they know how to make them, uh, a Trolloc offspring is a genetic throwback in the direction of the original human stock and the taint of evil is even stronger in them. Uh, now, Murdral have a number of different names uh, that are they're 
sort of colloquial to different regions and and different stories and whatnot that include fades, lurks, the eyeless, half men, uh, and the wolf nickname for them, which is. You guys are hurting me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I I know I know this, okay. and I will kick myself as soon as you say it. I, yeah, I was about to say as soon as you're going to say it, I'm going to go shit. I uh, you've that. already you've already said fades, lurks, eyeless, and halfman, right? Correct. Oh, what the hell do yes. they call them? Why can I not remember this? I did a I did a whole episode on the merge roll. <laughs> Uh, so the best part is I don't actually remember it either. I just remember <laughs> it being amazing. So, uh, I'm gonna look to the Google. Up. Indeed. Uh, let's see. Neverborn. Go back. The Neverborn. Never right. God. Ah! So good. Yes, and I I think that the the oh, wolves have the greatest yeah, nicknames do. for stuff. Uh. Honestly, the Shadow Killer and the Neverborn are like two blinder, of my favorites. Neverborn. They're so sight blinder, sight blinder is an IL right. one. Oh my god, it's so good. It is. Yeah. That's for the dark one. If if we're ranking na- nicknames, I I'd have to say the wolves have the top nicknames, and I'll come in very closely with a second. Agreed. And as much as it distasteful as I find them, the Sanchin are probably I mean, number three. Because they've got. We have to remember about the wolf names names. is it's the interpret. Most of the ones we find out are how Perrin interprets the the messages from the wolves. Yes, it's not like it's not like an actual. That's correct. Which makes Perrin that much more cool. With all kinds of names, right? (laughs) But anyway. Uh, so the Merdral have a number of of additional powers that are you know, in, in addition to what what Trollocs would usually be able to do, as well as certainly more than what you know a a human would be able to do. Uh, and most of their powers actually stem pretty much straight from the Dark One, uh, which is basically the shadow in them. Um, because as stated, they have the taint of evil far stronger than any standard Trolloc. Right. Uh, so they have uh, the ability to travel instantly to any place where shadows meet. Uh, they also are incredibly strong. They are incredibly fast. Uh, they have this incredibly piercing gaze, which is funny because one of the reasons that they are called the eyeless is they have no eyes and so really you're just looking into these just dead spots on a face which is just just terrifying just absolutely getting this you know sense of of dread and terror that wells up in you uh that is just you know all of the fear that you have ever felt in your entire life Um, it's it's true. It's apparently I mean, Agnor expended over one hundred Murdral attempting to learn more about their ability to travel between shadows, and was incapable of understanding it. Ugh, that's that's terrifying. It is. You know, Agnor is a scary fuck, dude. He's so terrifying. <laughs> but the uh, Murdral, I was always like. You know, during my high school, like emo, I don't want to say emo phase. That's not really a great way to put it. But during that, during that period of life where things are like just so dark, I really got into the merge raw. Like I really loved the merge raw as characters. I found them to be just pure darkness. And it was just, it, it wasn't even necessarily that they were so strong and so fast and, I think what makes them terrifying, at least to me, what makes them most terrifying is that they are so far removed from like humanity and life and creation. And just, just as we talked about just before is that the wolves call them the Neverborn. These are guys that they're disgusting. Like they're, they're, they're the polar opposite of who we 
as living beings are, which well, is something and, like a step that's even past like zombies. <laughs> oh yeah. Well, and, these guys and, have capability in, in some craziness, if you will. Uh, one of the other things that it says here and, and that it mentions in the books uh, is that Agenor actually surmises that fades are somehow slightly shifted out of phase with reality. So not only are they not human, not only are they not Trolloc, not only are they not fully shadow, but they're not even real. I mean, like they're clearly yeah. real, but like they're not even real. And they're- if you look at a uh, Merdral's reflection in a mirror, it it's just a blur. Like they're not touched by wind. They're not touched by reflection. They're not touched by physics. They're just right. crazy. <laughs> they're they're the electrons in the quantum physics of this world. <laughs> Basically. Professor Professor Josh has come out for the moment. I'm putting him away. Are you smoking your pipe? Oh, I am smoking my pipe. This well, this pipe is getting professor smoked. came from. <laughs> professor. Here, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna take a selfie right now of me on the mic with the pipe and I'm gonna post it. <laughs> to Twitter and I'm going to hashtag no context and I'm going to put as the caption that you need to watch the show to find out what's happening right now. Truth. Uh, But yeah, so the Trollocs are already scary in that regard, especially their ability to move between shadows. Um, (laughs) But add to that, the fact that while they are, are not really a a huge match for eyes to die, because other than the one exception that we have of Shidar Haran, uh, none of the Murdral can actually touch or affect the one power. Um, and therefore, right. Aes Sedai can pretty much take care of them as long as they can see them coming and, and can react fast enough, which we all know that Aes Sedai do have sort of a capability of seeing them coming, if you well, will. That's, and that's why, they have, that's why they have their warders as well, because yes. it's always nice to have a pair of eyes in the back of your head. And it's always Indeed. nice when that pair of eyes in the back of your head can also wield a sword quite efficient. Indeed. And warders do seem to be a relative match for Murdral, uh, even though they, it is said that they are basically the equivalent of a blade master. Almost all warders are also given, you know, as part of the warder bond, uh, extra strength and stamina and, uh, it, it does actually seem like ability with weapons, though that mostly seems to come from training uh, rather than an actual just initial right. affinity for it. Well, and uh, I don't but, even know that fades have a particular affinity to weapons per se. I think that the blessings, uh, blessings and or curse of the shadow. I mean, however you want to look at it, I think that's where they get, it's that sickly sort of out of phase with our thing. And then they can move faster and they're stronger. That doesn't necessarily give them a sharp technique. It just gives them speed and strength, which is beneficial. True. That's wonderful. No, but it as is. we know with Lan, like speed and strength are great, but it's also really nice to have, that pristine technique. technique. Yeah, no. And, and there are a number of times in the series where, uh, there are definitely people who with a sword are able to best merge all. So while they are definitely faster and stronger than most humans, uh, well then all pretty much all humans, um, they definitely are bestable. Um, though it is definitely very, very dangerous to fight a fade, uh, partially because their weapons are special and yes. it is not a situation where you know you just have to worry about a fatal blow from a murderall they actually have shadow tainted blades that are uh created yes. in thakandar using the souls of a human Yes, I uh, believe each one of them is quenched in the tainted yes. streams of Shale Gull and seasoned with a human soul, uh, which means that they are basically fatal even from a small, what would normally be a non fatal wound. Now, again, we are talking about situations, uh, or we were just 
just talking about situations where there are Aes Sedai involved. And unless the Murderall is capable of taking out the Aes Sedai, uh, most of the Thekindar wrought blades are effectively made moot by the fact that the Aes Sedai can then heal anyone who's been nicked by it with the one power. But if you don't have a healer there and you get nicked by a Thakandar blade, you are you you're good. Fucked. You're you're toast. <laughs> yeah, you're toast. And the the cool thing about these blades is this is actually one of the other shadow spawn that don't get a lot of airtime. But they have such a specialized calling, if you will. They're forgers. Yeah. They have one job. Their one job is to forge blades for merge all or fades. Mm-hmm. That's it. That's all they do. There's even talk that if they were to f- go too far away from Shail Ghoul, that they would, you know, turn to dust and just, yep. you know, disappear. They're, they're not like the Merdral, they're not fully in sync with this plane of existence. And so they exist in one place. They have one job. They do that job. They hand the blades over to the Madral, and that's the, 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 the those are scary blades. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and it's once also again, crazy to think about the fact that like, again, the forgers are also so, which we'll, we'll talk about them in a second more. Uh, but they're so out of everything and so not human that they basically just take and kill people yeah, and then make these blades out of their souls and seem to have absolutely no feeling on it one way or the other. Yeah. It's, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. But Good old uh, all. as we were talking about before, um, merge all are actually capable of, of linking with a limited number of Trollocs. Uh, This allows them an even greater scope of control over those uh, Trollocs. And it is one of the reasons that uh, Trollocs were actually capable of being used as infantry, uh, because when they were originally created, Trollocs were pretty much useless. Again, they wouldn't follow orders. Right. Or, I mean, they, they would follow orders if directly under a Merdral or one of the Forsaken or, you know, a number of other creatures, but when left to their own devices, they were completely just id. That's what, and they wouldn't do anything that the shadow wanted them to do. As I said, unless they were directly being monitored by a more powerful entity. And so the Merdral were introduced as the, sort of captains, sergeants, lieutenants, whatever you want to call them, of the infantry armies because they were scary enough to the Trollocs that they would listen to the Merdral, and the Merdral were smart enough and in control enough to carry out the orders of their superiors even when those superiors weren't on the battlefield with them. Right. Unfortunately, as as stated, the uh, it does have one drawback. Uh, when you link with a number of Trollocs, if you are taken down as the Murdral that is linked, uh, for some reason it does not work the other way around, where if they kill all the Trollocs, the Murdral dies. But if you kill the Murdral, all of the Trollocs that are linked with them seem to perish. <laughs> <laughs> it seemed like the opportune time. That's a pretty favorite yeah, indeed. Because you can kill uh, one being. I'll be hard. <laughs> kill one being. And there's a whole bunch of products that disappear. Well, and as and as yep. we discussed earlier, sometimes it's actually easier just to kill all the Trollocs. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> well, and and we all know why now, now that we've talked oh, yeah. about the merger all. Uh they're hard to kill. They're very hard to kill. Oh, and the the other like the the in in my opinion the absolutely most sort of scary part of a murdral, which it's eyeless gaze and its ability to just like throw fear into anyone 
is already like probably the second most terrifying and it's pretty bad by itself. But then you add into this that even when you actually get to the point where you best a murderall, you have fought it, you have won, you take off its head. Right. It refuses Hashtag to die. die. <laughs> which is the way that they describe it. It's not that it's not in, that it's not capable of dying. It's not that there's like some immortality thing. It just refuses to die. Thrashing about and just making <laughs> movements until at some point it accepts the fact that fair, if you were fighting and you got suddenly battle is- circumcised, you'd thrash around too. Get it? Cut off the head? <laughs> yeah. Cut off the Cut head. Cut off the head. All right. I don't know why I have I all see what you did effects. there. I'm going to abuse you. Because they're amazing. And because that's um, what's been missing this whole time. Ooh, God. Especially in... Well, see, there's uh, all- <laughs> now I'm just thinking about the fact that it it talks about the, the fact that Murdral, like, do that's what shit to say. people for- in, like, the... Bad the rapey fashion so we know they have dicks yeah. and the thing is they cannot <laughs> we know for a fact they cannot reproduce with humans so they do it yeah right, right. so, so they, they so, do which it makes that fun. scene in the eye of the world where Rand is being shown this vision of his mother tortured by Murdral all the worst yeah oh, well yeah, and it's, god it's let's tough. just take a second to recognize what a dick I mean, Ishamael yeah. is Oh, he's the worst. You're a betrayer of all hope indeed. That's a nice name. I mean, to be fair, the first time Dick. we ever see him, he heals a guy just so he can realize that he murdered his entire family. Yeah, he's a fucking huge dick. Right. Yep. But that's, that's all it's right. Yep, he's because- like, I want to mock you. I can't mock you because you're crazy. So tell you what, I'm going to heal you so that you can understand what you've done. And then I can make fun of you for it. Well, and the Dick. like. Honestly, the worst part of that for me is is obviously again the the him realizing it because he's too crazy right now to do so. But I I also like the line just before he does it, where he's just like, "I'm not even good at this," and so it's gonna hurt yeah. like hell just to make it so that you can hurt like hell. It's like, right? dude, you are such a dick. <laughs> That's also the role I want to play. So. All hail the Shamayel, <laughs> king of dicks. The fucker. Most asshole of all the <laughs> Most asshole. <laughs> Goddamn asshole. Love it. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Are you saying we elected Ishamael? I think Ishamael was. Can we call him Chief of the Taint because he's such an asshole? Chief of the Taint. Yes, I'm in. I'm down. I I ship, ship it. it. Is that so? How you you say so, it? so you ship Ishamael with a, with an asshole? Is pretty much what you're saying. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Yeah. My name is Ishamael. I uh. I, I, I fuck everybody, I fuck everybody up. Uh, that's this his, is my that's wife, uh, the asshole. <laughs> like a Asshole. floating fucking mongrel. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, guys, guys. His name is Isham A Hole. <laughs> hey oh, Robert Jordan, oh, you crafty you sly, bastard! My dog, love you so uh, much. <laughs> uh, no, but the yeah. the Merdrawler, they're they're yeah. terrifying. They're terrifying. Um, they really are. You you covered them well, sir. Is there and I mean, those two as we as we said, the, the Trollocs and the Murdral do make up the vast majority of what the uh the the people who fight Shadow Spawn end up actually facing. Right. Those those are those those are your heavy hitters when it comes to commonality of And we see both Shadow of those Spawn. uh in Eye of the World. So I think it's only fitting. Yeah, oh, I think it's only fitting that we yeah. talk about right. another shadow spawn that we see in the eye of the world, the Jumara. Agreed. Mm. So the Jumara, Jumara is a worm-like shadow spawn, uh, commonly called worms by the Borderlanders uh, and even the Forsaken, I believe. 
but they they yes. live in the blight, and they're so dangerous that even other creatures of the blight flee from them. Uh, a single Jumara <laughs> is said to be able to kill a Fade or Murdral easily. They lack tactile sensation, but they do feel hunger, and they have to be cut into pieces to be killed. According to Samael, they are the larval stage of an even more terrifying breed of Shadow Spawn, which is never actually really described. Uh, Jumar were one of Agnor's many nasty creations, and uh, again, Samael is like people call them worms now, but that's that's nothing compared to what you know they ultimately will become if they mature. Right. God. Just imagine. Mm. Blah. And yet it. Okay. And, and a lot of people, I, I know a lot of people don't like it when you draw comparisons to other stories, but I think it's awesome. I really do. I think it's awesome when people borrow um, ideas and, and make them their own. And the Jumara in the wheel of time, they don't get a lot of time. They don't get. We never a actually lot even of, physically see one. Do we not see one in the... Nope. We never see one? We never actually yeah. see they one. Know they're they are just described. <clears throat> and they are bearing down on our lovely group yeah. of world changers. And then they show up in the yeah. green man. That's what they're area. running from. Like right before they get absolutely torn. And when it talks about what they evolve, what they grow pieces. into, I think, I think the other creature that we do hear whispers about are the Kafar. And they're mentioning yes. in very passing. And it might uh, be that. And most people think they're, the people that know of them think they're locked in a stasis box. Um, however, Davron Bashir refers to them as blood rasps. Um, and Samuel mm-hmm. has previously spoken of them living in nests, which would kind of make sense. Uh, and then right. there's a point in the Eye of the World where it's talked about that it was another creation of Agonor that's a cross between flesh eating spiders, scorpions, and a human, a human resembling, resembling a lot of hands, teeth, and fur. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Which is terrifying. Yeah. I'm actually really glad that, uh, Robert Jordan stuck with the ones that he did, uh, instead of necessarily <laughs> making those a whole, big part of the books because well and what i was going to say is the jumara you've got numerous other examples of a giant worm type situation my favorite iteration of that is in dune um frank herbert when he writes the the worms of arrakis and i love that i it's one of my favorite stories and uh just how pivotal they are in that. But of course the Jumara and the worms of Arrakis are completely different creatures, <laughs> but, uh, but that's, but, uh, you know, that's what I love about the contrast there is, is they make it their own. They say, Nope, this is ours. Robert Jordan says, I really like this idea. I really like this concept, but I'm going to make it mine. And I think he does a really great job with that. Agreed. Yep. Agreed. And again, and it adds to it adds to the mythos. It adds to the whole situation of, well, what of this is legend and what of this is real? You know, when you've got Lan talking about uh, Jamara going, oh yeah, a few things in the blight, or you know, they don't want to mess with this shit, and it's like, okay, that's great, but we never actually see one, so to this day, we don't know. Is that legend or is that Lan going? No, this shit exists, or is that Lan? scaring three little boys from a backwaters town <laughs> you know i mean i mean i love to that be fair given the sounds and whatnot that they're hearing i would strongly s- lean towards oh land knows they're real and he's also very scared but at the same time again as you said since we never see one it exactly could just be i mean are, but, are they the mermaids of this world sailors seeing giant tails having no idea what they are going i thought i saw a person over there but i also saw a tail okay now mermaids sweet you know i mean there's there's and they even talk in at great length about people see strange things at the blight people experience strange things at the blight 
So, sure. you know, it, I love And it's the very world. hot and it is very oppressive. Yeah. And so there might actually be some some things that aren't legitimately there that people are seeing. Yeah, and I, I love how Robert Jordan sort of <laughs> weaves that into his story. <laughs> Josh? Yes? When you come out to visit me, <laughs> yes. please be aware that your your safety is not guaranteed if you continue to make <laughs> jokes. Damn. <laughs> <laughs> noted my good sir uh, noted no, professor mcrwain is I well aware never. of the risks <laughs> <laughs> well seeing as how that is sort of the uh the ones the the shadow spawn in the eye of the world um i think that might be a good cultural stopping point for this episode and then we can actually probably do an entire episode on just the golem, uh, not even necessarily talking about the dark hounds and the drag car, but I think that we should just get to everything next time, uh, so that this oh, one's yeah. not four and a half hours long. Okay, you guys- listeners, raise your hands if you want us to go on for four hours. <laughs> I see lots of hands. I don't see a single one. <laughs> you don't hear them? I hear them. I hear them. They're cheering for us. They want us to continue. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're on. Wait, what? <laughs> Hashtag awesomeness. Uh, hey, I mean, you know what? Keep going up, down, but I, I no, didn't want no, to, you're right. I, I think mean, you're right because we're about halfway through. We've got five this. more uh, named species, I guess, of shadow spawn to talk about. We got the dark. Yeah, gray men. and I think Zamora and, forgers and gray men well, we are not going to take us very long. But dark hounds, golem, yeah, we've pretty and much already covered the forgers. Yeah, it's really not that yeah, much exactly. Gray. So pretty we've much. still got the Zamora. We've got the Drakkar, the golem, the gray men, and the dark hounds. So, so your challenge, listeners, your 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 task, your mission, your homework. <laughs> you accept it. School us. School Have us. Have you ever not chosen to accept it, listeners? That's right. You, Your challenge is to listen to the podcast and then school us. What did we miss? Tell us what we missed. Tell us what we got wrong. Tell us what I made up. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I do that. It happens. It's the rum. Every once in a while. or Or the madness. No, no, no. That's the rum. That, that It's the rum? <laughs> is that confirmed? Confirmed. Hashtag rum. Uh, Hashtag it is madness. canon that it is the rum. <laughs> yeah. Usque is rum. We we uh, we decided that earlier. Fight me. Don't at we me. Did. Wait, at me. Go ahead, at me. Yes. So and if you want it to be moonshine, we can make the argument, and that's fine. But for us, Usque is rum. Deal with it. It's true. But that being said, that being uh, thank said. you very much for joining us on this this lovely episode. It was super fun, as always, with Josh and Andrew. Um, as stated, if we got anything wrong or you wanted to hear more about any particular subject, uh, we will actually be doing another one on Shadow Spawn, presumably next week. Um, so you have some you have some days here uh, between now and we usually record on tuesday or third or tuesday or wednesday so you have a few days to tell us what you'd like to hear more about and we're uh most of the time we're pretty more than happy to to go into that stuff um so next week we'll be talking about uh the other shadow spawn that make up the the forces of the darkness uh, and if there's anything that you guys need from us, uh, let us know, and we'll we'll see if we can include it in the episode. All right. Also, All right. Uh, to do that, <laughs> as I forgot, technically, I know most of our listeners already know this, but uh, if you'd like to go ahead and let us know those things... Uh, you can hop onto our Podbean. It has all of our uh, links to the Twitter, the Discord, the uh, email, all of that different stuff. 
uh, please send us a message through any of those channels. Uh, pop into Twitter of Time um, and talk to us there at, at Tower Podcast. Uh, we're always interested in hearing from you guys uh, about all of the things. Um, and if you liked tonight's episode, if you are uh, interested in going ahead and uh, helping us out to go ahead and continue to make content as well as you know possible merchandising in the future, we've already got some great quotes and we're not stopping there, uh, then you can always... Join our Patreon as well. Uh, if not, that's also totally acceptable. We are happy that you're just listening. Uh, but if you want more, we have more, and we'd be happy to have you on board for that. So Indeed. come on over and, and join us. In even more exciting news than the potential merchandise, which is hard to be more excited than, because some of it, <clears throat> some of it just sounds hilarious. Some of it True. sounds dope. Some of it you're going to want to get for Valentine's Day. Uh, so we're gonna say. So we're gonna say. Mm-hmm. You, you <laughs> patrons would have already heard the quote and probably already heard the idea. So that's another good reason to hop on the Patreon <laughs> if you're ready, getting ready for you know next year, February shopping, <laughs> Valentine's Day. There's certain things you need to embrace, and we're gonna have a product that uh, definitely uh, embraces that idea. Oh yeah, it will encourage but, you to embrace it. That is no true. pun intended. Um, five days after after. Uh, you guys are listening to this episode after it releases at least on the 13th of this month. Five days after puts us within the one month time frame from our one year anniversary for having the Black Tower podcast. Uh, I mind that they're already this we're already mm-hmm. this close to having been around for a year. So uh, there's already been some ideas in the Discord about what people would like to see for a one year anniversary kind of celebration episode. Um, there's been ideas about nostalgia. There's been the idea of a rap battle thrown out, uh, a bunch of fun stuff. So, uh, and that will actually be, uh, our on paper 50th episode as well. So, uh, it's, it's, that's pretty dope. I'm, I'm super, super excited, but if you have ideas again, send them to us just like you would any others. Um, definitely encourage you guys to join the discord. There's an entire channel dedicated to um, viewer and fan suggestions and feedback. Uh, So it's not just, Hey, you know, this could be a fun topic or something you should do for your one year anniversary. If you've been having issues with the podcast, if someone, if one person's audio seems to always be higher than the others or whatever the case is, um, let us know because we're not going to know how to fix things or what needs to be fixed unless you guys tell us. Indeed. It's true. We we grow through your critique. Or sometimes we ignore your critique. I'm not gonna say we ever just ignore make it. fun of it later. You might read it. You might forget about it. <clears throat> but that's the madness. <laughs> but you'd have to you'd have to listen to find out. And then you could call us out on it. See how this no, works? We haven't done it in a while. It's great. The random movie quote. What's that? We have not done a random Dude. movie quote. Well. Well, that is just peachy. Maybe we should uh, do one off the cuff right now. I, I don't have I don't have one off the cuff. Uh, I'm the worst. I could so think sorry. of I could think of a I got one I got one you ready and if and if you two know what it is just just say yes okay here we go <clears throat> I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived no is that too I'm, yes sorry I you I got know it, it. Yeah. you know it okay because I was gonna say if that's too obscure I get it because I do that a lot I make obscure references and people don't get it, but I'm going to throw that out there. I'm going to say that's the movie quote of the week. If you know what it is, put it in the discord. I'm going to do it again. Once more. I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. And with that, I bid you adieu. 
thank you so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for enjoying your 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 daily activities with us. Indeed. I just realized I was muted again. What? <laughs> You've been on mute. And I'm sitting there, I'm like, and for those of you that don't remember <laughs> yes. about the movie quote, and then it's like Josh is starting to turn, I was like, what the fuck? And I'm like, oh, I'm muted. But, uh, <laughs> what the hell, jerk? I'm talking. So yeah, yeah. for those of you who don't remember about the, the movie quote. quote. <laughs> yeah, the movie quote. The hey, thing Andrew, would you tell them about, about the movie quote? Anything? The first person that tweets to us. <laughs> <laughs> the quote, uh, where the quote is from, uh, got to have at least the movie, preferably movie and actor or actors, whoever said it, uh, character name. We'll be sh- we'll shout you out on on Twitter without fail. Um, and if you've tweeted out and everything and you want to make sure we see it, feel free to send us a message on Twitter. Hey, I, tw- uh, I tweeted at you guys, um, but we'll see it and we'll we'll give you a shout out for it. Yep. There you go. All right. One last time. The quote, the movie quote, the random movie quote is, I am the greatest swordsman that ever lived. And with that, I bid you a good night. And I want to thank you for tuning in. Thank you for following us on Podbean and on YouTube. And thank you for being you. I have been road hard and hung up wet. I have been Daniel. And I can confirm all of the above. And I am Andrew. (laughs) Good night. Thank you so much.